Today is Good Friday, as we all know. It's the day that we remember the fact that Jesus Christ died for us. And I want to pick up the story where Jesus and his disciples went to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a garden where they had often gone in the past, a place where there were trees, I would imagine grass, a place that I think seemed so ideal for praying. Jesus had such a desire to spend the last days of his life on earth in the presence of his Father. He wanted to pray. That was now the thing in his heart that he was absolutely so, so desperately keen to do. And as he was praying there, he took, as we heard already, he took three disciples further in, and then he went even further apart. And he fell on his knees, and he prayed, and he said, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you, but you, but what you will. And then again, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus knew that the cup of wrath had to be drunk. God is so holy. He is so perfect and he is righteous. Sin cannot exist in his presence. The God, the Father, cannot just forgive without anything being paid. There's got to be blood shed, and this Jesus did. Originally, God had made man perfect and had a wonderful man, had a wonderful relationship with the Father. If you just think back to Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the evening in that Garden of Eden, must have been absolutely wonderful. And that was what God wanted. But then sin came in and that relationship was broken. And now it had to be a man, and it had to be a perfect man who could fix this, who could change this, who could cause this friendship to be restored, this holy relationship to be made right again. And I think this morning we each need to realize the greatness of God's love for us, that he was willing to give his only son, that Jesus was willing to be, to, he was prepared to be that sacrifice. I think you and I would most probably be willing to lay down our lives for our children and our grandchildren. But for a world out there who doesn't even like you, and most of the world hated Jesus, and even so, he was willing to lay down his life. And there in the garden, he prayed. And the word of God tells you, according to Luke, that sweat drops of blood dripped from him. He was in agony. Can you imagine? Jesus knew before the time, what was going to happen? He knew every single thing that he was going to have to go through. It must have been absolutely agonizing. And yet he knew this was what he was prepared to do and what he was going to do. And while he was there praying, his disciples couldn't even pray with him. They just went to sleep. But Jesus kept on praying. And while he was doing that, there was an army who came in with swords and clubs 
Jesus could have called on millions, zillions of angels to come and protect him. But he didn't do that. He went out to them. He said to them, here am I. Yeah, I'm the one you're looking for. He even healed the ear of that man, Malchus, who um, Peter had taken out his sword and chopped that man's ear. Jesus even went and healed him. There was just no um, anti-feeling in any way. He was just giving himself. And my friends <laughs> have greater love that we will find or find anywhere. And I want every one of us to be conscious of the fact that it's not just the great world out there that he loves, but it's you, you as an individual, you specifically that he loved so much that he did that. And there they came. They didn't have to grab him. He went with them, and they took him to Annas, and then to Caiaphas. And these people were desperate to find something that they could bring against Jesus. They had to give some reason for him to be crucified. And they couldn't find anything, anything that was wrong. And then some guys came along and they said, we heard him say that he could break down that temple and rebuild it in three days. And this gave them a little bit of something to start talking about. And they asked, eventually asked Jesus, are you the Christ? And Jesus didn't deny it. And when he didn't deny it, they said, now we've got him. This is blasphemy. He is saying that he is the son of God. Now we can crucify him. And because the Jews didn't have the right to crucify people without the Roman government giving permission, they took him off to Pilate, the Roman governor. And Pilate questioned Jesus. He could find absolutely nothing wrong in Jesus. He tried, actually he tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews would not hear a thing about it. They kept on shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then Pilate said, well, you know, I usually let one person go free. There is this, well, who was a vile robber, Barabbas. He said, and there's Jesus. Wouldn't you rather have Jesus set free? No, no, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas, they wanted. Well, there was nothing more that Pilate felt he could do. So he sent Jesus to be flogged. And that was a flogging that ripped his flesh apart. Then they put this crown of thorns. And I believe that in that area, there are thorns growing that are especially long and very, very sharp. And they made this crown and they put it on his head. And then there were people who hit him with sticks. Can you imagine the agony? Can you imagine the pain of those thorns going deeper and deeper into your skull? The blood was running from his head. The blood was running from the face of Jesus where they plucked out his beard. It ran from his face, from his whole body. And then he had to carry his cross to Golgotha. And they were not that yet there when they called a man, Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene, to come and help. I somehow think, I don't know if that was the usual thing they did, but I think they were scared that Jesus would die before they could punish him further. And then they nailed him to this crude wooden cross through his hands, through his feet. Now blood was running not just from his head and his face and his body, but from his hands and his feet also. 
And they lifted that cross and they put it planted there in the ground in between two robbers. And they kept on mocking him. They kept on spitting at him. They said to him, view the Christ, come down. And so they continued. They divided his garments amongst them, the soldiers there. His outer garment, his tunic, was woven in one. They said, let's not cut that up. Let's um, throw the dice. I can't recall the word now, but whose it will be. All of this happened exactly as it was prophesied. Absolutely Every prophetic word in the Old Testament came true. And even now, while Jesus was hanging there in this agony, he thought of his mother. There she was kneeling to one side with a few women who'd also been followers of Jesus. And he looked at her, and he looked at his, the disciple that he loved so much, John, and he said to his mother, your son, and he said to John, your mother. And from that day, John took, him a home, took her home with him, and he looked after her. And at 12 o'clock, there was this darkness that came over the whole earth. And it was pitch black dark until 3 o'clock. And there was a mighty earthquake that pulled, blasted rocks open. People came out of tombs. The heavy, precious curtain in the temple tore from top to bottom. Special meaning in that. And Jesus cried out, It is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. He said to his father. And then he breathed his last. What an agonizing night and day for Jesus. And we call it Good Friday. How can we? Yes, because it was the most wonderful day for mankind. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant by that, that everything that was needed, everything to do with the purpose of why he had come to earth had been completed. Nothing more needed to be done. Once again, the bridge, he, well, rather Jesus bridged the deep gulf between God and man. Once again, it was possible for a wonderful relationship to be built, a friendship relationship between God the Father and mankind. That is why we call it Good Friday. It was a tough day for Jesus, but what a wonderful day for us. And the cross is proof that the love of Jesus was worth it. Romans 5 verse 8 says to us, but God demonstrates his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus completed his task, and we need to receive what he offers us. You know, there's a totally true story told of something that happened in 1829. Two men, George Wilson and Jane Porter, they had robbed a mail van, a mail carrier in the USA, and they were arrested, they were charged, found guilty on six different indictments, and they were sentenced to be hanged. And when the said day came, James Porter was hanged, but George had some very powerful, influential friends, and he, they had pleaded with the president and said, won't you pardon him? And George said, thank you, I don't want the pardon, I want to be hanged. They couldn't force the pardon onto him, so he was hanged. My friend, Jesus, paid the price for you not to have to be died, not to die for your sin, not to be sacrificed for your own sin. He gave you 
offers to you a pardon. But unless you receive it, it's no good to you. It cannot be forced onto you. And Jesus died not just to give us life, but to give us abundant life. We don't have to live lives of battling and striving and having difficult times every single day. No, we can be filled with joy, with peace, with his glory every single day of our lives because it's abundant life that he came to give us. And when you consider that Jesus took all the sin of the world, all the sickness of the world upon himself when he hung on that cross, I cannot understand why the whole world doesn't just run to him and receive what he offers them. You know, it is so, so much that we have in Christ Jesus. Just a few days ago, I was reading the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And just in the first two chapters, I marked possibly 10 or more, I think more than 10 places, where it said, in Christ Jesus you have this. Just for example, in the second chapter, it says, we were made alive together with Christ. We seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are the workmanship, God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And there are many, many more. I urge you, go and read those chapters when you have time. It's wonderful. Everything that Jesus arranged for us, that he purchased for us. He paid such a high price, such a desperately high price. Oh, if only, if only he could get what he purchased. You know, there's this story about a little boy. He carved a most beautiful little boat out of a soft wood made sails for it. It was beautiful. He took it to a river, and it flowed. Oh, it was magnificent. It sailed beautifully. And then one day, a huge wind came, and it blew that little boat away, and he just couldn't find it. He hunted, and he hunted. He couldn't find it, and he was so, so sad. And there one day, he was walking in town, and in a shop window, he saw a little boat, and he walked close, and he looked, and he said, but this is my little boat. And he ran into the shop, and he said to the shopkeeper, you've got my little boat here that I lost. Please, can I have it? And the shopkeeper said, no, 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 I paid for this boat, so this is the price. It was a lot of money. And the little guy went off, and he was desperate. And he worked, and he did, until he had enough money. And he went back, and he said, please, I want to buy my little boat. And he bought it. And he walked out holding this little boat to himself. And he said, precious little boat, oh, I love you. He said, little boat, I made you, and I bought you. Jesus paid for the whole world. His blood is still powerful enough to wash away all sin. The day you were saved, you received a clean slate. You received the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You were justified. You were made as though you had never sinned. You got a new identity. You were adopted as a child of God. You call him Father. Through that torn curtain in the temple, that was symbolic of the fact that you can now step into the presence of God, your Father. You do not have to go through a priest. You do not have to go through a pastor or anybody. You, as a child of God, can step into his presence. How wonderful, how absolutely glorious. Romans 6 verse 6 says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Hallelujah. God is good. 
so, so good. And you know, the word of God says that he loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ, his firstborn son. And he says he wants many brothers and sisters for Jesus. Oh, my friends, isn't that just too glorious? Everything has been done for you. Your new, you got a new spirit. Your spirit came alive. But now, where everything has been made new inside of you, you've, it's your responsibility to let that work through to the outside. And so the old habits, the old ways of thinking, the old arguments, all those things will change. And it's not difficult. It's not difficult to give up. Because we sang earlier, when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, these things, they just disappear. Because when you love somebody, you want to please that person. It's not difficult to change. I mean, when a girl gets married to a man, and I hope the man feels the same way about his wife, but you will, the woman starts cooking the kind of food that she knows he loves. She starts doing things that she knows will please him. It's the same with Jesus. If you love him, you want to do what pleases him. It's not difficult. So the old lifestyle just changes. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And my father will love you. And he and I will come and we will dwell with you. And in the same chapter in John 14, he says, the Holy Spirit will come and live in you, and he will remain with you forever. Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Jesus in us. Jesus is not bodily inside of us. His body is in heaven. But through the Holy Spirit, he is within each child of God. And I want to urge you, spend time in the Word. Let fill yourself with the Word. It's like chewing the cud, even talking to yourself about the Word. And it will fill even your subconscious. And when there's pressure, the words of the Lord will come forth. The Holy Spirit will bring it forth, and you will be able to continue. And you are a temple of God, His dwelling place. God, I promise you, God has wonderful, wonderful plans and purposes for your life. Something that really struck me as I read the gospel stories in the different gospels, in John he says, when the soldiers came, Jesus went out and he said, I am he. He knew who he was. He knew his identity. That's why he could be strong. Do you know your identity? Do you know who you are in Christ Jesus? Make sure of that. He says he loves you. He says you are precious in his sight. He says you are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. God loves you. If you have doubts about that, if you feel, you know, sometimes people get hurt by people or things, and they feel useless and they feel inadequate, I want to say to you, stand in front of the mirror in the morning and talk to that person in the mirror and say to that person, you know, Jesus loves you. You are so special in his sight. He's got wonderful plans for you today. Every morning, I pray and I say, Lord, this day belongs to you. I belong to you. I yield my everything. Do with me and through me whatever you want to do today. Oh, I pray that God will touch every heart. If there is anyone here this morning who says, but I don't know what you're talking about, but I also want that joy. I want that satisfaction. I want that certainty. I want purpose in my life. Then this morning is the time for you to come and we will pray for you. 
And I want to say if there's anybody here who has been so badly hurt, so badly hurt by something that happened in your life or what somebody did to you, and you just can't get away from it. Today, Jesus says to you, come to me. All who are weary, come to me. I will give you rest. Come and eat and drink. Buy without money. Come to Jesus now. He will heal every wound. He will take away every burden. And then I want to say to those of you who know you know Jesus utterly, totally, completely, you are one with him. My brother, my sister, Jesus deserves to get what he paid for. What can we do? We need to go and share the story. Child of God, you don't have an excuse. The world is suffering out there. It's on its way to an eternity without God. He paid a heavy price. I plead with you, help to bring in the harvest. Jesus said the harvest is ready. Bring in the harvest. Go out there and bring them in. I believe that right now, Jesus is moving here amongst us. And he's looking at you with longing in his eyes. He wants to say, my child, come and help me. Come and help me bring in the harvest. Tell other people what Jesus has done for you. Don't let his pain and his agony that he suffered be in vain.